But we start tonight with what we think, at least, are the three most important charts in the market, the dollar, the transports, and Caterpillar. All right, let's get to chart number one, the dollar. Dan flagged this one, breaking 92 above it today. So, Dan, what do you make of this chart? Why is this the most important chart to you? I think it has something to do with seasonally, as we're thinking about here in the quarter end, and we get into Q2 earnings reports over the next few weeks. We know that inflation was really a hot topic on the Q1 calls, and it was one of those things that I think a lot of companies, or S&P 5 companies in particular, were highlighting as the play, uh, potential really to be a headwind for margins, that sort of thing. Well, here's the thing, right? If a lower dollar is deemed to be inflationary, if the U.S. dollar, which really, if you look at that Dixie, um, the dollar index, is half of that is about the euro, um, you say to yourself, okay, if we bottom the dollars going higher, how does that affect um, inflation expectations, at least for U.S. corporate earnings? And, and listen, a strong dollar has a lot of implications for U.S. corporate earnings, too. But I just think it's really important to kind of put this on your radar as we head into Q3 and specifically into Q2 earnings. Well, it also has huge implications for a lot of trades that were weak dollar trades. And they were resource Mines. trades. They were, yep. they were global mm -hmm. trades. They were mining trades. Um, and, and on some level, they were even bank trades, right? Because if you think about the weaker dollar, it was part of it was, you know, at, at least some sense that you were getting this reflation. Yields were moving higher. So, I, look, I agree. I, I, I still think that the dollar was a very crowded trade to the downside. We're up 3% uh, off of that bottom. You saw the move it made on Fed Day. Um, and, and it almost feels like it's now fighting to kind of get back through that level. If it doesn't, I actually think you could see the dollar weaken up, but I agree. Uh, you know, the, the dollar is critical. There's so many asset classes. Yeah, especially the commodity. I mean, Guy, you've been talking about commodities, thinking that there's still more room here. So if the dollar goes higher, how can these trades go higher? Well, that tailwind for a weaker dollar obviously no longer exists, and it will become a headwind. And if, if Brian Kelly were here, he would correctly say that a stronger dollar is a wrecking ball for so many of these multinational names. And I agree with Tim. I mean, maybe it was uh, a little crowded, as Dan said as well, and maybe you're seeing this overcrowded bounce. I still think if you get some infrastructure deal, if these things start to come to fruition, the dollar is going to continue that trajectory lower, and that probably will continue to be good for the resource names. But there's no denying the dollar's had a big bounce off those lows. Karen, how do you think about the dollar in relationship to earnings? I guess, I mean, for multinationals, it'll be really important. But to me, it's sort of all about this inflation trade and where are and is inflation really transitory or not? I mean, all of these are obviously all connected, right? Inflation and the dollar and, and bonds and all of that. And it's just interesting to me that those inflation fears seem to have come way down. I mean, I don't know if you saw the uh, the Salesforce bond issuing today. I mean, they issued 40 year paper. And I think it was 95 basis points over treasuries for 40 year paper. So that's kind of astounding to me that, you know, the credit markets are wide open and well bid, even in the potential face of inflation. I really don't know what to make of it, actually. So I'm not trading around the dollar. I do a terrible job of that for sure. So yes, I don't sir. know what to make of it. I'm a little confounded. I mean, some of the commodities are also sending some mixed signals. I mean, everybody's citing the decline in lumber prices. We've done that right here on the show in terms of how much they've declined. 42 percent in the month. But you take a look at steel prices and they're still higher. So I'll go to Tim because you're you're in the steel trade, Tim. Yep, yep. Um, is there something unique about steel that are keeping the prices bid higher or well, some of it is, is, is it a, just mixed messages it's a supply demand dynamic especially also uh, you know that we we've argued rightly that the tariffs on the steel industry were devastatingly bad for the steel companies but you have a case here where especially some of the industrial growth what's going on in the auto sector what's going on in a lot of finished goods uh, and that steel prices i still think stay high and you look at hrc hot roll coil um they're they're roughly two and a half times where they were pre-covid so i mean i think that's right and housing prices stay. let's not forget the housing numbers we got this okay, morning sure. 30-year highs, arguably all-time highs, up 14.6% uh, on houses. And, th you know, that, that's inflationary. Right. And so if the Fed is going to actually start guiding towards maybe some sort of taper, uh, who knows, right? And we won't really get that language. We're not going to get the July meeting, but maybe um, at the end of the summer at Jackson Hole, what's going to happen here? The dollar is going to continue to rally here. And what's going to happen to that resource trade or what's left of it, at least in energy? I just think back to 2014, 15, 16, when the Fed started tapering in earnest and came off of ZERP, zero interest rate policy. Um, the dollar went up and crude went down devastatingly. 
All right, let's move on to chart number two here. The IYT transportation ETF closing in on its 100-day moving average. Tim, you thought this was one of the most important charts for the market. I, I, I did because, first of all, again, there's so many different ways to go with transports if you're a Dow theorist, which mm. we at least refer to this. I think it's a little bit of a dated theory, but again, it's the relationship between the industrial average and, and the transportation average, one taking the other higher or lower for that matter. Uh, and you have a case here where, look, this is, this is a rolling top possibly at, at a time when uh, – if we're worried about the Fed and, and we, we see all the industrial strength that we do see, it reminds me so much of the fourth quarter of 2018. So if you take that chart and you go back and you can see that that's the first move there. And that was also the last time, essentially, it traded through that 100-day aggressively. So I, I don't know that we're in June of 2018, but we all know what markets did in December of 2018. And Dan referenced this. This is the point where it, does the Fed come in and overstep their, uh, their bounds? And the transports will price that in before. And, and remember, FedEx was already flailing basically from June. So, you know, FedEx, which puts up monster numbers, there was a big upgrade today by Bank of America. And, and it's hard to argue against FedEx, but how much of this is priced in? So we have to watch this chart. I'm not saying it's rolling over here, but I'm telling you there is a similar setup to what we had back in the second half of 2018, where the Fed was in play. Uh, you priced in an enormous amount of growth, and it seemed like there's no way you could sell FedEx off. And in fact, it led a lot of other stocks lower. Karen, though, you bought FedEx on the weakness off of earnings. Right. I just, you know, I love the story. I think that some people think, all right, it's an e-commerce story. And so, you know, as the world reopens it, the e-commerce part of it dies. I don't believe that. I think there's been a structural change. I also, um, you know, their deliveries to businesses are often higher margin because they're much denser. And so we're going to see more of that. They have pricing power. That's what's really important. And they, between they and uh, UPS, you know, they're pretty much rationalizing the business in a very smart way. They, they're both having pricing power, which is excellent for both of them. So I think it's really cheap. If we get to a situation where the Fed is raising, let's say, or tapering, I want to be in a low PE multiple company like FedEx. I believe in, in so many parts of the story. So, you know, could it trade cheaper? Absolutely. If it does, I will likely be there buying then as well. Guy, does IYT cause you concern? I think Tim brings up a great point, and it should. I mean, I understand the Dow theory when, you know, I was young, it was a big deal. Nowadays, it doesn't hold as much it weight, but it's still important. Then, right? And I think it's good to, you know, <laughs> it, 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 as it turns out, it was sort of discovered. I think we just found I was, electricity, you know, I, too. Thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that, Mel. I mean, it really makes me feel all warm and fuzzy. But I think it's important to point out because, you know, the rails have been on fire. A lot of these names that we talk about all the time have been on fire, starting to sort of run out of steam. I agree with Karen. I think FedEx is a monster on valuation without question, and it's gotten itself off the mat since that earnings sell-off we saw last week. But to talk about the IYT, I think, is important. And I know you get mad at us when we bring back the guests, as they say, but I don't know if I'm allowed to go back in time to what Dan just said about, you know, if the Fed were to taper what that means for the dollar. I agree, but if that is offset by the fiscal side of the equation, if the government mm. continues to spend money like drunken sailors, I think that will be the other side. I think I'll take the other side of that rising dollar. I will continue to say the dollar goes lower. Yeah, Sorry I just to do say that this. to you, Mel. I'm sure you're making a face of me right now. Yeah, she is, Guy. No, as, as am I, as is Tim. Yep. Um, thank you for that. No, I, I think you said something that the market sniffed this stuff out. We're seeing this. We saw it in lumber, that sort of thing. Lumber is anticipating that we had 30-year highs in housing, that sort of thing. I just said about the IYT purely on a technical level, sitting right on that 100-day moving average right here around 260, and there's an air pocket down to the 200-day moving average at 235. So, you know, a lot of these stocks, I think, have incorporated a lot of good narratives about weak uh, or weird uh, dynamics in the in the supply demand sort of situation here and supply chains and the like. Um, but to me, I think that if they can't act well as the S&P is making new highs seemingly every day, there's probably more downside. So this is a canary in your view. I, I think so. I mean, I'm not saying that. I, and, and granted, I don't think that the market, you know, it, it feels like frothy a little bit. It, we just kind of incrementally make new highs. What was the S&P up? Two bips today. I mean, literally two bips today. That's not great. I think we'd all love to see a really sharp kind of sell off to see what the investors are made of here, maybe down 5% or something but like that. But this, this, you know, our, our 
opening the show with three of the most important charts you're going to see. Uh, according think, to as, us. According yes. to us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit of a macro class, right? And, yeah. and I think what Karen is saying about Caterpillar, excuse me, we're going to talk about Caterpillar, what's saying about FedEx is, is, is very important with this stock. This is a company that's really on top of its game. The, the margin improvement, the efficiencies of this company, and it was only two years ago that you know we were running a string of terrible quarters where this management team was under a ton of pressure. This is a very different company with some of those secular trends, but also just what they're doing bottom up. All right, let's uh, talk about Caterpillar. This yeah, is chart not? number three. Caterpillar is down nearly 13% from its 52-week high. Guy, this one causes you concern. It does, because this is obviously the poster child for the global growth story, at least one of them. And we've said, talked about it for quite some time. I think we've all been very constructive on the name, and it has had a ridiculous run. But if you look what since they reported earnings, I think at the end of April, uh, the stock traded up briefly, and it's, to your point, down 14% off that recent all-time high. Somewhat concerning, because that quarter was astonishing, in my opinion. And I think given the fact that you're talking about 25 to 30% EPS growth, you should be looking at a stock that's well north of the prices it's currently trading at. Begs the question, what does Caterpillar know that we don't? Now, again, they report, I believe, middle of July or thereabouts. But one thing sort of, or actually two things sort of stay with me. Carter Braxton Worth, who does a tremendous job on this show and so many others, specifically Options Action, each Friday at 530. A few weeks ago, if not a month or so ago, he talked about Caterpillar maybe getting a bit ahead of itself. He saw a sell-off coming, and he was right. And Morgan Stanley post earnings actually had an underweight on the name with a $181 price target. I mention it because if, in fact, Caterpillar is the poster child for global growth, maybe we should be watching it more closely than we have been. I guess that's the question. Is it a cat specific story or is it a poster child? Tim, where do you stand? I, again, look, what, what happens with companies during difficult times is they become lean and they become efficient. They become, you know, the, I think the, the reference to maybe it was FedEx, maybe it was Caterpillar. I, you know, the, the elephant can dance. Um, and I remember hearing this when we went through some of the, the, the crisis. And it forces these companies, these big industrial companies, to actually learn how to dance. In Caterpillar's case, there's no question uh, this is a company that is running very smooth. And, in fact, the multiple, and depending on where you are, I think the street you know, says they should be trading uh, around 19, 20, 21 times. That makes it a $240 stock right here. And, and again, it's a function, I think, of this company running well. But there's no question Guy is bringing this up much in the same way, it, really, we'd be talking about transports here. I mean, Caterpillar is, is a flagship member of this club. And, and clearly, this is what people have been placing a lot of faith in. You know, we're, we're highlighting three charts, but these are all sort of part of a, of a mosaic, if you will, Karen, in terms of, of where the market could mm -hmm. be going. And so you, the takeaway from these three charts with theoretically and presumably be fairly negative for the markets as we sit here pretty much at record highs. But is that your uh, conclusion, Karen? Well, I always like to come back to Yogi Berra, you know, so we're lost, but we're making good time. So I'm not quite sure where it all ends <laughs> up, but I think that the, to me, it's the labor numbers are really going to be important. And if they stay in the middle of the fairway, I think we can get out of here just fine. So that's kind of what I... It's not the most likely scenario, but it's certainly not impossible at all. So I, we are getting a lot of mixed messages because the world is full of mixed messages. But I'm more optimistic on the global growth story. And um, so I'm staying long. And I, I think one other thing we didn't really talk about is the rotation of these things. They're out of favor. Instead, people want to own Zoom and DocuSign. And I don't think that's really a commentary on their business. It's just sentiment and what's out of favor. I'm so used to being out of favor. I'm fine with it. I'm happy to own a portfolio that's unfashionable. Wow. Hold on, Karen. Always You're in, in a lot favor. of favor around Always. here. Let's Always just be clear. Favor. Stop that. Stop that talk. <laughs> well, I, I think Karen makes a really good point about the rotations here. So the S&P is notching new highs every day, and we're seeing some groups that act very poorly. We're just talking about them over the last few weeks or so. Um, so obviously the rotations are helping out, which really kind of draws you into what's the breadth of the market, right? And, and it's not particularly great at the moment. It's fine. We know, well, it's F MAGA, Tim. And those five names make up about 20% of the S&P 500 and about 40% of the NASDAQ 100, which is pretty astounding when you think about it, and they're back in favor right now. That's not a great setup, I don't think, into Q2 earnings over the next few weeks. We're going to kind of continue to surge into Q2 ending, and then if they continue to go into their earnings, we saw this after Q1, it's going to be really hard for them to rally, no, no matter how good the results are, because there are going to be difficult comparisons, I think, year over year.
Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.